Hey everyone, Anarch here. Today's video will be focused upon a very important topic in leftist theory, namely the role and nature of the state in the revolutionary process. It would be an understatement to say that this has been a point of contention for a variety of committed socialists. Indeed, it represents the most significant early theoretical split in the left, one which has endured until this day. Over the course of this video, we will inspect why this is the case and why this division has not disappeared, despite a century of experiments, both with states and without. As we begin this analysis, I'd like to refer to a quote from the book The Bolshevik Myth, in which the anarchist Alexander Berkman tells the story of his deportation from America to the Soviet Union between the years of 1919 to 1922. Despite what you might assume, given his anarchist ideology, Berkman was willing to sideline his skepticism of the state in the revolutionary process. Indeed, upon his arrival he wrote, a feeling of solemnity, of awe, overwhelmed me. Thus my pious old forefathers must have felt on first entering the Holy of Holies. A strong desire was upon me to kneel down and kiss the ground, the ground consecrated by the lifeblood of generations of suffering and martyrdom, consecrated anew by the revolutionists of my own day. Never before not even at the first caress of freedom on that glorious May Day, 1906, after fourteen years in a Pennsylvania prison, had I been stirred so profoundly. I longed to embrace humanity, to lay my heart at its feet, to give my life a thousand times to the service of the social revolution. Shortly after, in fact, he recounts an event where he confronted a dissident Russian anarchist who was giving a speech to a crowd. We anarchists, the dissident anarchist was saying, are willing to work with the Bolsheviki if they will treat us right. But I warn you that we won't stand for suppression. If you attempt it, it will mean war between us. Berkman jumped on the platform. Let not this great hour be debased by unworthy thoughts. From now on, we are all one, one in the sacred work of the revolution, one in its defense, one in our common aim for the freedom and welfare of the people. Socialists or anarchists, our theoretical differences are left behind. We are all revolutionists now, and shoulder to shoulder we'll stand together to fight and to work for the liberating revolution. Comrades, heroes of the great revolutionary struggles of Russia, in the name of the American deportees, I greet you. In their name, I say to you, we've come to learn not to teach, to learn and to help. This was the attitude of many anarchists toward the Russian Revolution. It wasn't perfect, they might have imagined, but it was the best bet that leftism had at the time. Berkman, a committed opponent of the state, counseled his fellow anarchists to support the Bolsheviks. Kropotkin, too, always a vocal critic of the state, was heartened by the promise he saw there. The anarchists of the last wave of revolutionary acts suspended their skepticism in order to see if the flower of state socialism might bloom into liberation. And they can't be blamed for having withheld their skepticism in face of what appeared to be an exhilarating victory. Indeed, it must have seemed like the world revolution was just around the bend. However, unlike the leftists of 1917, we now have in hand the empirical outcomes of the state experiments of the 20th century. Thus, in the following series, I will argue for why we must reject a repetition of this historical cycle. First, I'll carry out a theoretical inspection of the state as an institution, and disentangle how the ideologies which cling to it have been corrupted so deeply. Then, in the following videos, I'll move on to inspect the historical record more closely, such that we can witness the degradation of these revolutionary projects in greater detail. The tasks we have ahead of us are 
far too important to avoid speaking the truth out of fears of sectarianism. It's a solemn duty that we have to the people of our societies to bring something far more than just a marginal improvement, something better than a new aesthetic for an old system. In order for this to happen, it depends upon our vocal opposition to the failed tactics of the past. And all evidence that can be found leads the careful observer to only one conclusion. The state is counter-revolutionary. So, if we're going to have this discussion, it only seems appropriate that we should answer a very basic question. Namely, what is the state? Well, there's a very common definition, first defined by Max Weber, that the state is the human community that successfully claims the monopoly of the legitimate use of violence within a given territory. This definition is largely functional and is a very good way to disentangle complicated conversations, but it's insufficient if we're really going to develop a complete understanding of our goals and if we wish to lay out what the abolition of the truly oppressive aspects of the state will even look like. Enrico Malatesta, however, gives a more expansive coverage. Anarchists, including this writer, have used the word state, and still do, to mean the sum total of the political, legislative, judiciary, military, and financial institutions through which the management of their own affairs, the control over their personal behavior, and the responsibility for their personal safety are taken away from the people and entrusted to others who, by usurpation or delegation, are vested with the powers to make the laws for everything and everybody and to oblige the people to observe them, if need be, by the use of collective force. This definition includes almost every important aspect of the state, yet loses the territorial nature of Weber. Kropotkin, however, brings us full circle, synthesizing Malatesta and Weber. The state, he says, not only includes the existence of a power situated above society, but also of a territorial concentration, as well as the concentration in the hands of a few of many functions in the life of societies. A whole mechanism of legislation and of policing has to be developed in order to subject some classes to the domination of others. We've left out the quibbles of these two thinkers in which they develop distinctions between state and government. Although useful, they'll prove unnecessary for our inspection. Nonetheless, when we combine these definitions, we can now see what aspects in particular that the anarchist objects to in the institution of the state. It's not only Weber's legitimate use of violence within a territory which is objectionable, although that certainly comprises the core ultimatum for their paradigm. It's the fact that the state is a top-down schema of social enforcement, inherently predicated upon diminishing the direct control by the people, centralizing the judicial, military, and political functions of society into a body of privileged rulers. The very existence of such an entity is thus guaranteed to create a class structure in which the functionaries of the state and their collaborators operate above the people transmuting the masses into subjects. This last aspect is particularly emphasized by Rudolf Rocker in his work Nationalism and Culture. Every power presupposes some form of human slavery, for the division of society into higher and lower classes is one of the first conditions of its existence. The separation of men into castes, orders, and classes occurring in every power structure corresponds to an inner necessity for the separation of the possessors of privilege from the people. And although Rocker illustrates this beautifully in his own work, I'll leave that reading to you. If the origin and toxicity of the state interests you, you'll find plenty of food for thought in both the works Nationalism and Culture by Rudolf Rocker and The State, Its Historic Role by Peter Kropotkin. 
Instead, I intend to use these foundations to reformulate an argument I made in another one of my videos, the case against hierarchy. The argument goes as follows. The state is a small group of people vested with the unitary control over the functions of governance and the legally legitimate power to coerce others to abide by that control. Regardless of the temporary existence of selfless leaders, self-interested people will exist within the state. The power of the state is what allows those people to act in their self-interest. Therefore, it's in the interest of all the people that operate the state to perpetuate the power of the state. With this in mind, each time the power of the state is threatened, those who operate the state will have a tendency to stymie that threat. But every power structure that exists is competition for the state. Thus, the state stands at odds with any structure which may threaten its control over society. The masses, however, have an inherent power in their numbers and in their primary function as the laborers that make society run. So, the state will always have an institutional tendency to view the masses as a threat to the unitary power of the state. And, therefore, the state will always seek to control and suppress the latent power of the masses, except when it serves the interests of the state. This formulation alone guarantees an antagonism between the people and the institution of the state, centralized, vesting control over the organs of coercion and violence, seeking to establish and maintain a set of class hierarchies which bolster its own power. Just starting from the simple assumptions that people sometimes act in their own self-interest, that the state is comprised of people, and that the state is vested with the power to coerce society, it's a guaranteed outcome that this affair of subjugation will take place over a long enough timeline. As Rocker said, every power presupposes some form of human slavery. The only conceivable counter-argument that a benevolent leadership which does not act in their own self-interest may sit in the seats of power neglects a simple reality. All humans die eventually. And once those benevolent dictators die, the reins will be handed back over to a new group of human beings, turning the state, on a long enough timeline, into a game of Russian roulette with the future of the masses lying in the balance. It gets worse, however. It's not only that individuals in power often seek to act in their own self-interest, nor is it the inherent tendency of the state to create and perpetuate class structures by its nature. It's also the tendency of even well-intentioned human beings, given a particular tool, to see the application of that tool as the solution to all problems. This cognitive bias is sometimes called the Law of the Instrument, or Maslow's Hammer. It's famously contained in the pithy adage that, to the hammer, every problem looks like a nail. And we shouldn't be shocked that this cognitive bias occurs enough to have earned such a reputation. Humans have an inherent desire to solve the problems that lie in front of them. And given a single tool to solve that problem, they'll have a tendency to attempt and discover every way that that particular tool could conceivably overcome that particular problem. Every challenge that arises is then reframed as a question of how it's a problem for the wielder, and mutated by this frame into something which the wielder of the tool perceives as solvable through their means. Such a situation is even more perverse in light of the fact that the state's primary tools are coercion and the manufacture of consent. Within its very nature, it is thus a paternalistic and chauvinistic entity, bound to view all those who are subject to its will as unruly when they disobey, 
and useful only when they abide. It's an entity in a perpetual process of moral decline, a warden eternally destined to betray its charge. Left to its own devices over a long enough time, it can only be guaranteed to represent its own interests and the joint interests of its most powerful collaborators, not the exploited. The very act of centralizing power is thus an act of violence against the workers. So long as the state is allowed to exist, worker emancipation is impossible, in the same way that the class antagonisms of capitalism can't be eliminated while the means of production are controlled by the capitalists. Class abolition can then only ever hope to succeed if it corresponds to an abolition of centralized power. Such a statement is not a preference. It's a foundational requirement for the next phase of human development. And all attempts to make the state into a vehicle for liberation are misguided negotiations with a potent counter-revolutionary force. So, if all of this is true, why did leftists ever convince themselves that it could be otherwise? Well, we will now inspect what theoretical and rhetorical aspects of leftist ideology led to the rot in the authoritarian foundations, so that we might better understand what created their repeated failures in a practical context. First, lying at the center of the authoritarian left conceptualization is the notion that any socialist project managed by the people is too weak and too aimless to defend itself from sabotage, and that instead of the people governing themselves in the interim, the state will need to rapidly centralize power, then wield that power benevolently in the interests of the masses. This particular affair, it must be said, is not strictly contained anywhere within Marxist literature. In fact, Marx said something quite contrary at the First International, namely that the emancipation of the working classes must be conquered by the working classes themselves, that the struggle for the emancipation of the working classes means not a struggle for class privileges and monopolies, but for equal rights and duties, and the abolition of all class rule. However, some of Marx's rhetorical choices and early theoretical emphasis left the notion of what should be done and by what practice struggle should take place sufficiently vague, making the threat of co-option inevitable. The most pertinent of these rhetorical choices was that Marx called for a stage in which there would be a dictatorship of the proletariat. But Marx almost certainly did not mean that a centralized bureaucracy with complete control should domineer the workers and the previous bourgeois alike. Although it's true that he advocated centralization even as early as 1848 in the Communist Manifesto, by 1891 in his critique of the Gotha program, Marx was brutally criticizing the German socialists for their belief that socialism could be achieved through a paternalistic state, saying, Free state? What is this? It is by no means the aim of the workers who have got rid of the narrow mentality of humble subjects to set the state free. Freedom consists in converting the state from an organ superimposed upon society into one completely subordinate to it. And today, too, the forms of state are more free or less free to the extent that they restrict the freedom of the state. We can see by this that the notion that worker control meant centralized state control was certainly not a view held by the end of Marx's life. Indeed, the only state that Marx could see as consistent with worker control was one completely subordinated to the direct will of the workers. In fact, in critique of the Gotha program, he excoriated the German Social Democrats for the notion that they should even presume to educate the masses. Government and church should rather be equally excluded from any influence on the school. The state has need, on the contrary, of a very stern education by the people. 
So where did the authoritarian tendency arise if not from Marx? Well, upon inspection of the historical record, the truest forerunner to the authoritarian ideology appears to be an individual named Louis-Auguste Blanqui. Blanqui, an early French socialist revolutionary, did not believe that the proletarian were up to the task of revolution on their own. Instead, Blanqui conceived of the need of a small group of revolutionary professionals who would form a vanguard party and then lead the workers in a coup against the state, proceeding to suppress the previous ruling class until a time would come that a transition to socialism could take place. Blanqui did not attempt to conceive of the socialist future, nor when, how, and where the transition from vanguard rule to worker control might take place. It was far more important that the previous ruling class was defeated at all costs. This is not the last we'll hear of such a viewpoint, although its next adherents will not call themselves Blancists. With these foundations in place, we can now turn our inspection to the next and perhaps most significant development in the authoritarian leftist ideology, calling itself Marxist-Leninism. This ideology, basing itself on the thought of Vladimir Lenin, would animate a great many revolutionary struggles and ideological offshoots to come. However, we don't have sufficient time to inspect all of those. Instead, we'll look at the most significant of these offshoots, Marxist-Leninist-Maoism, in part three of this video series. For now, let's start at the beginning. This quote from Lenin's work, What is to be Done, is quite instructive of the attitude he takes toward revolutionary organization. Class political consciousness can be brought to the workers only from without. That is, only from outside the economic struggle from outside the sphere of relations between the workers and the employers. Leninism is predicated on a fundamental lack of faith in the workers to organize themselves and to arrive upon a coherent conception of their class position without a party to lead them. To Lenin, the vanguard, occupied by enlightened socialist thinkers, was a representative body of proletarian class consciousness. Thus, it was the job of the revolutionary party to tutor the masses on their liberation from without. Wherein the workers lacked such a guiding hand, Lenin took a dim view of their mass potential, believing that the highest state that they could achieve on their own was what he called trade union consciousness, that is to say, the ability to band together into trade unions. Such a conception, of course, neglects the fact that trade unionism was a movement with its own adherents and thinkers, developed and pioneered forth by other revolutionaries. A movement, in fact, which would be far more responsible for the radical and transformative elements of the Russian Revolution than the Bolsheviks. But in Lenin's mind, the masses had to develop past this trade union consciousness to succeed in revolutionary activity. And, in order for them to develop in the way he wanted, they would have to submit to vanguard rule. In 1904, Rosa Luxemburg, after having read Lenin's One Step Forward, Two Steps Back, wrote a response called Organizational Questions of the Russian Social Democracy to criticize this attitude. In it, she said, the two principles on which Lenin's centralism rests are precisely these. 1. The blind subordination, in the smallest detail, of all party organs to the party center, which alone thinks, guides, and decides for all. And 2. The rigorous separation of the organized nucleus of revolutionaries from its social revolutionary surroundings. Such centralism is a mechanical transposition of the organizational principles of Blancism onto the mass movement of the socialist working class. From this, we can see that the connection of Lenin's thought to Blanqui is not something I've just made up. 
Lenin was accused of having advocated Blancism so often, he even saw fit to mount defenses against the accusation. But his only defense was that he was not a Blancist because his vanguard would organize the masses to achieve an absolute control, unlike Blanqui, whose vanguard planned the coup alone until the last moment. Ultimately, however, what has to be recognized is that Lenin's conception of the party was not really so much a body representing proletarian consciousness, but a body demanding submission of the proletarian to vanguard consciousness. This is what Luxembourg meant when she mentioned how Lenin's centralism represented a separation of the organized nucleus of revolutionaries from its social revolutionary surroundings. Indeed, Lenin seemed to view the people as having a natural desire to submit. Luxembourg continues, The authentic proletarian, Lenin suggests, finds by reason of his class instinct a kind of voluptuous pleasure in abandoning himself to the clutch of firm leadership and pitiless discipline. The centralizing tendency of Lenin far be it from any conception of accountability to the revolutionary masses, was instead a way of configuring machine-like obedience among the workers. In fact, it would not even seem that Lenin viewed alienation of labor as something to be dismantled. Lenin seems to demonstrate again that his conception of socialist organization is quite mechanistic, the discipline Lenin has in mind is being implanted in the working class not only by the factory, but also by the military and the existing state bureaucracy, by the entire mechanism of the centralized bourgeois state. There is something perverse in this conception, wherein Lenin does not seem to want to change the relations of the workers to the means of production, but instead to simply refocus proletarian obedience to the capitalists with proletarian obedience to vanguard authority. Luxembourg, so disturbed by Lenin's ideas, would say, Nothing will more surely enslave a young labor movement to an intellectual elite hungry for power than this bureaucratic straitjacket, which will immobilize the movement and turn it into an automaton manipulated by a central committee. And she was not the only one to have foreseen disaster based on Lenin's words. Trotsky himself, before the February Revolution ever took place, saw in Lenin's expedient ideology the risk for what he called substitutionism. Said simply, Trotsky was worried that in Leninism, the organization of the party substitutes itself for the party as a whole. Then the central committee substitutes itself for the organization. And finally, the dictator substitutes himself for the central committee. Such an arrangement did indeed take place, and justified itself by Leninist logic that, since the party is the proletarian consciousness, then when the party forms a state dictatorship, it is a dictatorship of the proletariat. The practical results of such sophistry would be far from trivial. It's a tragic irony that Trotsky himself, once in power in that very same substitutionist party, only a few years after the revolution, would be the one to vocalize its attitude so clearly. The party is obliged to maintain its dictatorship, regardless of temporary vacillations, even in the working class. The dictatorship does not base itself at every given moment on the formal principle of a worker's democracy. I think it should be quite clear that none of this represents a development of Marx. Quite the opposite. These ideas represent a drastic break with Marx's theory. Whereas Marx believed that any power representing the workers must be completely subordinated to the workers, Lenin perceived that the workers had to be completely subordinated to the party. Whereas Marx thought that the revolutionary state had to be educated by the masses, Lenin thought that the masses should be educated by the state. Further, because Lenin astutely avoided a coherent understanding of anarchism, 
his ideology was then destined to fall victim to all of the problems we laid out at the beginning of this video. Leninism does not eliminate the inherent antagonisms between the state and the workers, it exaggerates them. Leninism not only views domination as a useful tool, it can only conceive of domination as a tool. For this reason, even projects that would come later, which sought to temper the bureaucracy seen in Leninism while maintaining vanguard ideology, would find out all too late what kind of contradictory thing they had incubated in their revolutionary projects. Lenin's ideology would carry forth as a sort of blankest sickness, passed on by force in some occasions, and by willing recipients in others. But in all occasions, leading to an eventual abolition of socialism, as all centralist attempts are invariably doomed to do. Even after all of this analysis, however, I don't expect you to take what I've said for granted. After all, to exist only within the realm of ideas is not sufficient if we're going to build a revolutionary future. That's why, in the next two parts of this series, I'm going to focus on a coverage of the two preeminent statist experiments, the USSR and Maoist China. What I'll demonstrate is that in both, though these two projects had very different ideological premises to their leadership, where there existed some possibility for socialism, it was destined to be destroyed by a state-driven counter-revolution. And the workers, having allowed such an entity the excuse to domineer them, would eventually find nothing left of their socialist aspirations therein. Finally, in part four, we'll return to our theoretical considerations and explain how the modern left has come to excuse these failures, demonstrating the rhetorical emptiness of their appeals and offering a countervailing narrative that will help us understand how we might avoid the same pitfalls in the next revolutionary wave. Before we finish our video for today, however, I would like to return to Alexander Berkman's diary. Although initially he sidelined his principles out of an almost religious awe at the potential for liberation in 1919, by 1922 his tone had changed considerably. These were the last words he recorded before returning to America. Gray are the passing days. One by one, the embers of hope have died out. Terror and despotism have crushed the life born in October. The slogans of the revolution are forsworn, its ideals stifled in the blood of the people. The breath of yesterday is dooming millions to death. The shadow of today hangs like a black pall over the country. Dictatorship is trampling the masses underfoot. The revolution is dead. Its spirit cries in the wilderness. High time the truth about the Bolsheviki were told. The whited sepulchre must be unmasked. The clay feet of the fetish beguiling the international proletariat to fatal will of the wisps exposed. The Bolshevik myth must be destroyed. I have decided to leave Russia. Soon, we shall see what events led Berkman to this change of heart. Thanks for watching, everybody. If you want to help spread the work I'm doing here, click the like button, subscribe to the channel, and leave a comment. Also, if you want to help me eat and pay the bills, become a patron at the Patreon link below. Anyway, I'll see you next time.